Hello, my name is David Cross. Um, my name is Matthew Cornford. We're going to tell you a little bit about our piece of work, which is downstairs in the, uh, in the studio exhibition space below this room. To start, I thought it'd be quite good to reflect on where we are now. And Stephen's already alluded to this a little bit. And um, very recently, I got a copy of this book by Anne Minton called Ground Control. And the paperback edition actually does feature a whole new chapter that Anne Minton's written on the, uh, the Olympics, the Olympic site. And um, in the book, she talks about, in the first chapter, how the Wellcome Trust, interestingly enough, made a bid of £1 billion to buy the entire Olympic Park. And their ambition was to create a global hub for scientific research and innovation, focusing on health, technology and sports science, in conjunction with two new universities and including a museum, social housing and the creation of new jobs. This bid was actually uh, rejected because it was seen as uh, not value for money. Instead, what's happening, and again, I take a lot of this from uh, Anne Minton's uh, chapter on the Olympics, is that the site is being actually sold off piecemeal, privately. And this view shows the Olympic Village, which was bought by a consortium led by the Qatari royal family. Um, and again, one of the reasons that London got the Olympics was that this was supposed to be, that one of the legacies was that this would be social, a lot of the housing would be social, and it remains to be seen whether any of this will be affordable. Westfield Shopping Centre, Stratford, a new shopping, socialising and entertainment destination, privately owned, it's very safe, it's very clean and orderly. No undesirables, no unpleasantness here. The 500 acre Olympic Park is to be known as the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, but despite the royal title, the Olympic Park will not be a royal park or a public park, but a private park, privately owned and privately controlled. So here we are just outside the perimeter of the Olympic Park. And the White Building was funded by Arts Council England and Bloomberg contributed as well. So it makes an ideal context for our installation, the White Bear Effect. Our commission from Film of Video Umbrella involved dialogue with Dr Richard Ramsey, a neuroscientist. And in our first conversation with Richard, he described the White Bear Effect, which is a paradox noted by the Russian author Dostoevsky and which is tested over a century later in experiments by scientists Daniel Wegner and David Schneider. Uh, our relationship with Richard was, was, a, was an interesting one in terms of the dialogue, and the research that he was exploring was into how athletes are, eliminate negative mental imagery to enhance their sporting performance. Richard was very interested in the concept of flow, or being in the zone, a state of positive absorption and mental focus producing successful intuitive or spontaneous action. Richard was interested in how the absorption of mental focus could be, could be harnessed and almost sort of, you could be trained to think like this. A number of, we were, we were fascinated by this because in a way a number of our projects have been related to the idea of negation and whether through blockage, rejection or concealment. There's a kind of antagonism, in a way, between Richard's focus on the positive and our interest in the negative. And that led to a very interesting exchange of ideas where we described something from two different facets in almost a form of dialectical reasoning that went through our conversations. In devising our work, one of our prime questions was uh, driven by the desire to step back from the content proper um, of sport. And we asked, what is the function of sport in ideological terms? We know that watching sport brings people together, and we know that it provides excitement, but what is its ideological role? After much debate, we came to the conclusion that sport sustains an image of fair play. And in a world full of injustice, with big structures of power working to maintain an unfair advantage for small groups of people, it's really important for those in charge that the majority of people have in their mind a clear image of a level playing field in which skill and chance determine the outcome. In Guy Debord's famous book, The Society of the Spectacle, um, he, traces, he, he traces the development of modern society in which authentic social life has been replaced with the representation, with representation the, decline of being into, the decline of being into having and having into merely appearing. The spectacle is not a collection of images, Debord writes. Rather, it's a social relationship between people that is mediated by images. 
The artist and theorist Victor Bergin, who was a great influence on me as a student, paid very close attention to the camera viewfinder as a framing device which articulates social power. Bergin traced the origin of this social power back in time to the picture plane of the Renaissance easel painting. He went behind that, in turn, to the post and lintel construction of doors and windows in architecture. Bergen observed that here perhaps is the origin of the metaphoric connection between the perspectival image with its illusion of space behind the picture frame and a window on the world. And that's what gives many uh, lens-based images their association with a perceived reality. This illustration by Sir John Tenniel to Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass shows Alice entering Wonderland through a mirror. The picture plane is a key point of access to the imaginary, but this access is two-way, and it includes reversals and reciprocal interactions. By investing in, in the idea that we can enter the space of the image, what's actually happening is that we allow the image to enter us and to occupy our thoughts. Now, for our project, um, we, were, we had a number of agendas, really. One was to, obviously, we were working with a with a scientist. We were also very focused on the idea of sport and the Olympics and also we're working with an organisation called Film Video Umbrella which is around commissioning artists to make moving image work. And the thing that started to really fascinate us was the, if you like, the sporting spectacle but particularly the way this spectacle is now represented through LED signs. Um, the spectacular environment of the Olympic Stadium heightens the formation of mental images of sporting success. These images are deployed on brilliant LED screens. We might, you, almost around us all the time now in shopping malls, arenas uh, and at temporary events. We became interested in focusing our attention on the screen. We were interested in how the material properties of the LED technology relate to the ideological effect each light emitting diode functions like a pixel, a fragment of light that corresponds to the individual receptor of cells in the retina of the human eye. LED, light emitting diode screens, apply the phenomenon of additive colour. Just as on a computer screen, the RGB, which stands for red, green and blue, signifies the light which merges to create a sensation, an illusion almost, of white light. What we wanted to do was to engage with the mechanics of vision in a way um, through producing a, a spatial experience for the viewer and to expand uh, the zone in a way which exists between the image um, as a, a cognitive experience uh, through to its, exper its uh, experience as a perceptual phenomenon. What we did then was create a situation, and hopefully you'll get the chance to experience it downstairs. Close to the LED screen is experienced as a technological grid of pulsing coloured lights. As you move further back though, the points of light merge to become recognisable as an image. The area we were interested in, the zone if you will, was between the image and the screen. And this corresponds to the liminal space in art between abstraction and figuration which we associated with the space in science between perception and cognition. What we found was that the particular structure of the screen we've used uh, enables us to confront the illusory transparency of the image with the actual transparency of the screen. It's possible to look at the surface of the picture plane and imagine uh, a notional three-dimensional space which is depicted behind it. But it's also possible, literally, to look through and past the LED lights and see what's going on behind in the rest of the gallery space. So there's two types of transparency there, one imaginary or ideological and one physical or actual, if you will. Yeah, the work invites people to, or the audience, the viewers, to freely move around the installation. You can take a range of subject positions, including the spectator or the observer or the performer. And here's what's strange about it. If you're looking at the... LED image, concentrating, working out what's going on, trying to figure out the difference, what's abstract and what's figurative in that screen. There's another position which you can take, which another viewer takes, of the person viewing that screen. It's quite, it's quite a strange dynamic between who's been observed and who's the spectator, and whether these people are in effect therefore performing in some way. The experience keeps changing, depending on where you stand and what you choose to focus on. So what we were doing in a way, what we were attempting to do, was to connect the mechanics of seeing 
to the technology of representation, a kind of materialist analytical approach in a way, looking at the physicality uh, of how the image is presented to us as a set of uh, bulbs and wires uh, encased in a framework, and how as cognitive beings in a way we are embodied physically, we're not detached from the physical space we're in, what we experience depends very much on where we stand. By ex presenting an experience of vision as physically embodied, our real aim was to engage people not as passive spectators, but as active participants in the creation of meaning.